KSAT 12. The Night Beat starts right now. And tonight we begin with new information about the suspects detained in connection with the migrant tragedy yesterday. We are learning charges have been filed. Tonight we also have their names. Juan Francisco de Luna Bilbao and Juan Claudio de Luna Mendez. Both arrested last night at a home in San Antonio. That address listed on the registration for the tractor trailer carrying the migrants. Both men charged with possession of a weapon by an alien illegally in the United States. Federal investigators have not been clear on whether smuggling charges will be filed or if the men were even actually involved. Now, a third suspect in this case, the alleged driver of the tractor trailer, was found in a field with some of the survivors. Investigators believe that he was trying to blend in with them. His name hasn't been released, and it's unclear as to whether he's going to be charged. Now, in past similar cases, anybody found to be connected with a tragedy like this could be charged with conspiracy to transport migrants resulting in death. Now, as of tonight, officials have identified 35 of the 51 victims who passed away. But there are still more questions about who was inside that trailer. 39 men and 12 women are among the dead. However, officials say some of those victims may be teenagers. At last check, at least 13 people being treated in several local hospitals. The night team's John Paul Barajas with the latest. A memorial site is now located where authorities found an 18 wheeler with 62 migrants inside. 46 of them pronounced dead on scene. As the criminal investigation continues, people are coming to pay their respects. One man saying, I was startled. How is it possible that something like this could happen? To lock them in a trailer and then abandon them? I spent the whole day thinking I had to come visit. We mourn for those 51 immigrants who came to us to breathe that fresh air, but instead found death in the state of Texas, suffering in a van or a trailer. County Judge Nelson Wolf and Precinct 1 Commissioner Rebecca Clay Flores say the death of more than 50 migrants is a tragedy. Local officials calling it the largest mass casualty event in San Antonio's history. The number of bodies, a daunting task for the county medical examiner. Our medical examiner's office has carried a heavy load over the last few weeks from the Uvalde victims and now today. Because of the high number of victims from last night, we have reached out to neighboring counties for assistance. The 18-wheeler carrying the migrants was found in the commissioner's precinct. Today, the commissioner visited two of the survivors who are being treated at University Hospital, an adolescent boy who she says is in need of prayers, as well as a 23-year-old woman from Guatemala whose condition is improving. And the two had just been taken. Now, the county commissioner also tells us that even with the added help, they don't have a timeline for when they'll be done identifying all the bodies. But once the medical examiners do conclude their findings, that information will then be turned over to the person's home country's consulate. I know that we pointed out this uh, memorial before, but I want to do it one more time. It has all the things you normally find. It has the crosses, the flowers, the candles. But one thing that stood out was the water bottles. That signifies the water that these people desperately needed being trapped in that trailer for who knows how long. Now, this is a developing story, and we'll continue to try to bring you the latest as soon as possible. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. John Paul, thank you. First responders who found those victims are also telling us what they saw. They worked quickly. They focused on the people who needed the most urgent care. Listen. My job was, was to get in there, assist the medics in getting making sure that we were not missing anyone, that there was, if there was someone we could do something for, we would do it. It was a horrific scene, um, something I'll never forget, and it's, it'll stick with us forever. That same man goes on to say that by the time more EMTs arrived, all of the living victims were very close to death and extremely critical. As part of our KSAG Q&A at 6, we spoke with Mayor Ron Nuremberg tonight. He was on the scene last night, held a news conference with other city officials. The mayor says the situation is horrific, and he wants to remind people to not forget those who died are humans, just like you or me. You know, these are 50 individuals who had families, uh, many of whom, you know, are, are grieving themselves. Uh, many possibly don't know the status of their loved one. 
Uh, and knowing that these uh, folks climbed into the back of this trailer uh, in uh, hoping to likely go to a better place. And this is um, this is what happens. Those feelings of sadness felt not only by the mayor, but also for much of the San Antonio community. But also with that comes a lot of frustration. People say they're getting too used to prayers and vigils following migrants' deaths. Tonight, several people united in grief at Pearsall Park, right near the place where that semi was found. As the night team's Patty Santos reports to them, this tragedy is personal. In the name of Jesus the Christ, the Savior of this world, amen. A prayer for the 50 plus dead migrants and for those still fighting for their lives at local hospitals for a tragic plight that's become a familiar story for the San Antonio community. I just couldn't believe that here we are again. Many can only imagine what these victims felt like as they were suffocating inside the 18 wheeler. Jessica Asua knows it because she lived it. I, I came here when I was 14 years old in an 18 wheeler as well and I passed out from the heat. So this hits. I was lucky that I woke up. Her heart goes out to the families that are mourning. I see them, I hear them, um, and we are trying our best. This woman who lives near Quintana Road says she has seen migrants jump off trains. She says she gives them what she can to make sure they don't we die. Seen we seen them. We seen them, but they scatter all around in the field. We give them clothes, food, anything we can. And tonight, community members tell me they are tired of seeing the same ending to this tragic story and then nothing really being done to prevent it in the future. Tonight, city and county leaders were at tonight's vigil, which was put on by SA Stands. Steve Stefania. Patty, thank you. In the meantime, President Joe Biden releasing a statement today on this tragedy. He called the deaths horrifying and heartbreaking. The president goes on to say in part, quote, my administration will continue to do everything possible to stop human smugglers and traffickers from taking advantage of people who are seeking to enter the United States between ports of entry, end quote. The president released that statement while in Europe. He's been there since Saturday for international summits. And calling it a humanitarian crisis that his office needs help with, Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar sending a letter to President Joe Biden tonight asking for more resources and a meeting. Case had obtained a copy of that letter in which the sheriff asked for more assistance in fighting those that, quote, profit off the misery of smuggling victims, end quote. He also calls Governor Greg Abbott's tactics at the border ineffective and a campaign stunt. The sheriff ends his letter with this, quote, I'm asking for you to meet with myself and other urban county Texas sheriffs so that together we can address these issues at hand, not as the enemy invasion it has been portrayed as, but as the human humanitarian crisis it truly is, end quote. This is the third time Sheriff Salazar says he's reached out to the president in his letter he says he has yet to receive a response. By the way, tomorrow, Governor Abbott will be holding a press conference in Eagle Pass to give a border security update. He'll be joined by the director of DPS. A San Antonio business is also stepping in to help ensure the victims' families will be able to bury their loved ones, that they can be identified. Mission Park Funeral Homes and Cemeteries says it will use its resources to help the Bear County Medical Examiner. It's just our way of participating to be able to help families in need, no matter where they come from. It's 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 in our community. It happened in our community, and we have to take take it head on right here in our community. The Mission Park says it is working with county and local officials to help with caskets and paperwork for all 51 victims. That's expected to be a lengthy process as the ME is still identifying victims and trying to contact their families. Now, if you take out your phone and scan this QR code, it's going to take you right to our web page where we have all the information on this migrant tragedy, along with the latest information we know so far. And of course, we'll continue to keep updating that website. The grandmother of the Uvalde school shooter is now out of University Hospital. Yeah, if you recall, Celia Martinez Gonzalez was shot before the shooter attacked Robb Elementary School 
where 19 students and two teachers died. 66 year old was discharged from the hospital today. Gonzalez was shot in the face, but was still able to call 911. A family member told the New York Post that the bullet went into her jaw next to her mouth and shattered all of her teeth. In a tweet, University Hospital wrote that she was in good condition. Now, the Uvalde Consolidated Independent School District is getting $10 million. Last week, the city's mayor said that Robb Elementary would be demolished. We told you that. Now, the large donation is coming from HEB and the Butt family. They gave money to the school district's new nonprofit, the Uvalde CISD Moving Forward Foundation. That money is also going to go towards a new school building and a memorial park, which would be at the school's current location. And it would also go towards more security at that new building. The last few lingering showers are winding down right now and by and large have come to an end. You look at the radar over the past two hours and the heavy rain that we had earlier this afternoon slowly tapered off, gradually dissipated. We held on to it as long as we could and we we're fortunate enough to get some just soaking rain this evening. But now, as you can see on the radar, a lot of it has really fizzled out. You'd be surprised to see how much rain fell in some neighborhoods. We're going to go over those rainfall accumulations and talk about that storm cluster in the Gulf and its odds of affecting us with more rain in just a bit. Coming up, we're looking at what migrants risk to come to the U.S. You're going to see the challenges for them and border agents. Eye-opening testimony in the sixth day of the January 6th hearing on Capitol Hill. What this top White House aide says President Trump knew the day of the attack and how he wanted to respond. A ruling going against the overturning of Roe versus Wade. It's actually happening in Texas, and we're going to discuss why some clinics are temporarily allowed to provide abortion services right now. Abortions up to six weeks of pregnancy are now resuming in Texas, and this is after a judge granted a temporary restraining order blocking the state's pre-Roe versus Wade abortion ban. Those services can only resume in those clinics that are named in that lawsuit, and for San Antonio, that would be the Alamo Women's Reproductive Services. The other clinics are in Austin, Houston, Fort Worth, Dallas, McAllen, and McKinney. A hearing is now set for July 12th to make that order more permanent. Explosive testimony at the sixth public hearing of the January 6th investigation. Today's key witness was Cassidy Hutchinson, a top aide to former chief of staff Mark Meadows. She alleged that former President Donald Trump knew that his supporters on January 6th had weapons and that he didn't care. Hutchinson says that Trump was furious that his rally didn't appear to be at maximum capacity. Meantime, the Secret Service is not commenting on the specifics, but... It says that it would like to respond under oath. The president responded tonight in a flurry of posts saying that he didn't know Hutchinson. And now for a look at your headlines in your Nightbeat News Flash. It can be a dangerous journey for those trying to seek asylum in the U.S. as we saw yesterday. KSAT met up with U.S. Border Patrol agents to see how they use their resources to try to rescue as many migrants as possible. Now we want to remind you the images you're about to see are a reenactment. When people are somewhere in the brush, EMTs and specialty operation units use a drone and canines are all activated in hopes of finding that person alive. Since October, more than 900 rescues have happened, some in the Rio Grande itself, according to Border Patrol, along with 140 deaths. As you know, the valley can be very unforgiving and a daunting trek. The thick brush, the quicksand light ground, the relentless heat and humidity, and the wildlife combine to make it difficult, if not impossible, journey for those who are ill prepared. The Border Patrol officials say they expect emergency calls from distressed migrants to increase as the summer continues, as it gets hotter. To help combat this, the Rio Grande Valley sector expanding its missing migrant program to help stop the loss of life or if needed, help identify the deceased. A mass shooting plan at an Amazon delivery facility foiled in San Antonio after disturbing remarks were given to police leading to an arrest. 19 year old Rodolfo Aceves is now charged with terroristic threats. According to the arrest affidavit, Aceves worked as a subcontractor for Amazon at the plant. A coworker told police that he allegedly said he considered the Uvalde school shooter, quote, an idol, end quote, and that he knew what school he would shoot up. He also allegedly admitted to the coworker that he recently bought a rifle. His father questioned by police and said he had a mental illness and stopped taking his medication. 
a few years ago. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. So now we want to take a live look outside right here, 72 degrees, and I don't see any rain right there. Adam, is the reason that we got rain earlier is that what brought down the temperatures? Oh, absolutely. It was nice, kind of like yesterday when the temperatures fell off so abruptly and significantly right when the rains hit. Now, this is not a look at current actual radar returns. This is the Doppler radar estimates in terms of actual rainfall totals. And so you look at the dark greens, that indicates a little over an inch. The yellows, that's when you get up to about two inches. And notice how a good chunk of our area, especially around 1604 on the east side and the west side of town, had that yellow to orange coloring. And you can really get specific here. We're 1604, northeast side of town. Okay, Madison High School right there, Nacogdoches Road. You get down into this neighborhood, and this is one of the sweet spots in terms of rainfall totals and accumulation near Bluewood Drive, Fountainwood Street, 4.1 inches. Near Dreamwood Drive and Nacogdoches Road, about four inches of rain estimated by the Doppler radar. And we did have some similar similar accumulations, just not quite as impressive, particularly on the west side of town and even near downtown on the south side, just south of the uh, basically the AT&T Center and the Alamo Dome. So those are the actual estimates from the radar. When you look at the rain gauge measurements, this is the ground truth and some of the rain gauges out there. Fair Oaks Ranch 1.8, Alamo Ranch far west side 2.86, Windcrest just under four inches. What about the aquifer though? We need the rain right here. Northern Bear County in this purple and kind of reddish color. That's the recharge and the contributing zone. And we did over the past couple of days get some decent rainfall. So the aquifer should respond and get a bit of a boost from this rainfall. There's the radar from today. Beautiful sight. A bit of good news on this Tuesday. We're still watching this highly disorganized cluster of showers and thunderstorms south of Louisiana in the Gulf of Mexico. It's basically just a lot of tropical moisture, a lot of tropical rain, a little bit of lightning and thunder. However, there is a 40% chance this could turn into a tropical depression. It could get a title. Whether or not it actually has a title, it's still just going to be a plume of rain that comes along the Texas coastline and into parts of Texas in the days ahead. Late this week and into the first part of the weekend, but you look at the spaghetti plots, <laughs> they're all over the place from San Antonio to Louisiana. And one reason for this is because until there's a center of circulation, it's hard to actually measure what's going on and for the models to grasp what should happen. However, I do think odds favor that moisture ending up farther east of San Antonio, so along the Gulf Coast, and then maybe Lavaca County, you know, Hallettsville to Cuero, and then over to Houston. That's where I think odds are favored for most of that rain. Otherwise, a few random pop-up afternoon showers, 20% chance all the way every afternoon through Saturday. Officially at the airport, 0.53 with a high temperature of 91 today. Actually, today was the first day we were below average in terms of temperatures and right now low to mid 70s. Here's your 12 hour forecast 73 in the morning, partly cloudy by noon, 90 degrees, a high temperature of 96, just that 20% tomorrow chance tomorrow afternoon, meaning a few highly isolated and brief random pop up showers and then just sunny and back to near 100 by Sunday and the 4th of July. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, in college football, they talk about the Nick Saban tree. Yep. They talk about the Bill Belichick tree in NFL. Got to talk about Greg Popovich when it comes to the NBA. It, it's just expanding. And when we come back, we'll talk about Will Hardy now is going to be a new head coach in the NBA. In fact, he'll be the youngest. We have to tell us when we come back and a recommendation on the punishment for Deshaun Watson coming in. The Utah Jazz are finalizing a five-year contract to make former Spur now Boston Celtics assistant coach Will Hardy their next head coach. When Dunn Hardy, who's now 34 years old, will be the youngest coach in the NBA, beating out three other finalists. He will replace Quinn Snyder, who resigned earlier this month after leading the Jazz the last eight seasons with a 372-264 record that included six trips to the playoffs. Hardy spent 11 seasons in San Antonio from an intern, a video coordinator, later an assistant coach. And in fact, producer Mike Klein found this video from 2017 practice. And look who's in it. Besides Pop and former Spurs coach Larry Brown, Will, VP Monty Williams, Emmy Udoka, and Becky Hammond, all NBA or WNBA head coaches right now, and former 
Hornets assistant or head coach James Borrego. Now that the Spurs three first round draft picks have been appropriately introduced to the city of San Antonio and their new home, the AT&T Center, along with their families. Now they get down to the business of starting their life on the court as they prepare for the playing in the summer league. The games in Las Vegas start in less than two weeks, only July 8th, and it would be a good first look at all three. Number nine overall, six foot nine, Jeremy Sohan out of Baylor, wingman Malachi Brennan from The Ohio State, and Notre Dame guard Blake Wesley, who already started to grow a bond. We just, we got, you know, our, our group chats of right now. Yeah. Um, we're supposed to be meeting a couple dudes um, like Josh Primo and all them later. I'm pretty sure I'm doing that throughout this week, so we're excited. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Uh, DeJounte Mari texted me, which is really cool. And mm -hmm. I feel like he already, you know, is making a connection with us and he, sure. you know, wants to help us out. And I feel like we're, we're going to be sponges and just learn from them. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The NFL has informed Deshaun Watson, Cleveland Browns, and the Players Association that it intends on recommending that Watson be handed an indefinite suspension and miss at least all of next season without pay for violating the league's personal code of conduct. That is being reported by the Wall Street Journal before the hearings before disciplinary officer Sue L. Robinson began today. Under that recommendation, Watson would miss all of next season and would be allowed to apply for reinstatement for the 2023 season after being accused of sexual assault and miscarriage conduct during massages and 24 civil lawsuits filed by women. The Browns were prepared for this recommendation after fully guaranteeing Watson's $230 million contract following their trade with the Houston Texans for six draft picks. That's because Watson's contract is only good for $1 million next season. We're learning more about the lawsuit filed against the Houston Texans on Monday for enabling the, quote, egregious behavior of the former quarterback Deshaun Watson during massages. Houston attorney Tony Busby filed the lawsuit against the team for also shielding Watson to protect him and the organization. The lawsuit was filed on behalf of a former massage therapist student who alleges that Watson assaulted her and harassed her. Busby, the same attorney who represented 24 women in civil lawsuits against Watson for his behavior during massages, selling 20 of those 24 already. Now, Busby believes this is just the first of many to come against the Houston Texans organization following the New York Times investigation that revealed the team provided Watson with access to the Houstonian where some of the massages occurred and non-disclosure statements as early as 2020. Meantime, Baker Mayfield admits he's frustrated that his trade away from the Cleveland Browns did not happen before minicamp. The only team that appears interested in Mayfield at this time are the Carolina Panthers, but speaking from his youth camp, which by the way, he moved from Ohio to Norma, Oklahoma that started today, Mayfield was asked if there's any chance he might stick around with the Browns since it appears Watson will not be able to play next season. I think it's uh, been pretty obvious the mutual decision on both sides is, is to move on. You know, I'm, I'm thankful for my four years in Cleveland. There's a lot of ups and downs and a ton of learning experiences that, uh, you know, I'll forever keep with me. You know, I, teammates and friends and, and relationships that I'll have for a lifetime and it's the support staff in Cleveland, the people of Cleveland, it's a great sports town. So I, I'm thankful for it. And it's, there's no resentment towards the city of Cleveland by any means. But I think a lot of people think if they didn't have a quarterback for the next year, would, would there be any chance of reconciliation there? No, I, I think for that to happen, there would have to be some reaching out. But uh, we're, we're ready to move on, I think, on both sides. All right, Longhorns gain another five-star recruit next. Texas Longhorns are reaping the benefits of having the number one recruit in the nation and quarterback Arch Manning commit to the 40 acres for the class of 2023. The Longhorns have a commitment from five-star defensive back Derek Williams now, six foot two, 185 pounds out of Westgate High School in New Iberia, Louisiana. And he chose Texas after his weekend visit to Austin over Texas A&M, Alabama, Miami, LSU, Clemson, and Oklahoma, according to ESPN. That's a total of seven new players who have committed to Texas for the 2023 recruiting class since Manning made his announcement. Check out the big ring reveal today on social media by UTSA safety Rashad Wisdom. This is what you can get when you win Conference USA for the first time in school history. What a great piece of hardware, as Wisdom wrote, earned, not given. It comes complete with a trophy inscribed CUSA champion on the side, his name, triangle of toughness, inside the mantra, win the day. This comes after the UTSA Roadrunners finished their season 12-2 and overall, beat Western Kentucky 49-41 to in a wild game back in December, and that's one good-looking ring, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's I like, like that. Bling. Like I said earlier up, it's birds up bling. <laughs> it sure <Yeah>. is. <laughs> of course he would say that. Of course I would. We'll be right back. <laughs>